get started. I'm happy to wish. Great. So, so hello, everybody. Uh, so just to remind you, I, I've muted everybody just to cut down on background noise, but uh, please uh, free to unmute yourself at any time and ask questions of Bruno. Absolutely. Uh, if you have audio, you can uh, type in the, the chat feature on WebEx, and I will ask your question. I see it uh, on your behalf. Uh, all right, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bruno Benedetti from the University of Miami. Will tell us about optimal that optimal more sector and not unique. Thank you, Bruno. Thanks for the online invitation. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me fine. And please, uh, as you said, interrupt me with questions uh, anytime. Actually, so I talk is open for for questions and So present. Uh, some uh, Karima Di Prasito, who is in Israel at Hebrew University. And Dragon Lutz, who uh, is at uh, Tilburg, Germany. Uh, this lesson actually has no uh, completeness, in particular bibliographical completeness. It very well be that I did uh, the theorem without mentioning all of the important contributions before and also all generalizations uh, afterwards. All right? Some combat with, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. I just want to stress a couple of things to make sure we're on the same page. I'm going to talk about simplicial complexes, and by this I mean always something finite. So finite action of simplices, non-empty, any two simplex intersect at a common case. So dimensional case of what I'm going to talk about, because the graph. Here I have to do a couple of uh, simplicial complexes. The one of that is uh, pure in the sense that all facets have this one of the right is not. This for me, is empty face that is uh, properly containing only one other face. For graphs, you should think of just uh, leaves. Right? So I've, I don't know how visible this is into your screens, but I, I have tried to make the three faces uh, in red. So on the left has four free edges, and that's it. Those are the only three faces. The on the right instead as a uh, eight and also one uh, three vertex. And we mean the deletion of a free face. So you delete the free face and then by addition of simplicial complex, you're also obliged to delete the containing it, the only lesser containing. For example, in a graph, of course, if you delete a vertex, you also the edge uh, lead it. Otherwise you wouldn't have uh, Okay. This moves uh, of this type on the compasses above. Uh, some, of course, I've selected one of the three faces uh, 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 both ways. You might notice that this operation can make a pure complex non-pure and also the other way around. If you weigh with steps of the type and at the point, with some sequence, then the complex is called collapsible. For example, on the left is collapsible. Um, basically, you want to continue, you will get to a point. The one I don't know if anybody can see a quick way of determining why, but if not, the reason is essentially that each collapse is just uh, making a little bit of a dent into your complex without changing its homology on or homotopy. In particular, if you start with something that does not have the homotopy type of a point, Point. So the comps just because it's not simply connected, for example. So collapse implies contractible. What about the converse? It turns already from work, uh, uh, the Zeman, that there are easy counterexamples for the converse. The even called done set is just take triangle and identify the boundary edges in a moving way. So actually, any the way you want to put the arrows would work, except it just don't form a cycle. All right? So on the right, I have uh, displayed a triangulation, so a way to realize it, in fact, as a simplicial complex, so that uh, the property that no two every angle intersect in a common place is met. Less possible triangulation uh, because it has exactly eight vertices. Please note, I don't know if you can see levels on the edges. I hope so. 
plot that they are identified so that the levels of the edges are always 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, only with the orientation we mentioned. Uh, working on this thing in 2009, and this is a term that actually appeared later with, with Frank Lutz. So this uh, this state vertex triangulation can be drawn using straight edges in R3. It's obvious that you can draw it in, a, in R3 somehow doing the identification with curved edges, but not entirely obvious that you can do it linearly. Out that if actually with some sort of ingenuity, so like playing a puzzle, you carefully insert edges, angles, and tetrahedra into this realization, in geometricalization, what you get is a three body with the same number of vertices, a property that uh, sequence collapses is down to a point, and some other sequence instead um, gets stuck in the done set. I have done set is collapsible. The reason that every edge of the done set, as you can see, Belong triangles, uh, depending whether you pick it from the inside or from the boundary. So the reason essentially is that from the triangle here, here, here boundary. So mini edges that were here initially belong to one triangle, but after you glue things three times, they will belong to three triangles. So no edge belongs to one triangle only. Uh, we have to even start our collection sequence. Okay, uh, so this preliminary is the main question I want to address uh, in the first part of my talk is this. So what about the minimum number of free faces a simple complex can have? For example, a two-dimensional simplicial complex that is collapsible, how many free edges can it have? This is not at least one, of course, because we've seen with the done, if you have no free whatsoever, then you cannot even start. So it's not collapsible. Also, at most, it plus one, because there's an easy example of a collapsible complex with these one faces, namely this simplex. For example, in dimension two, the, the triangle is obviously three free edges. So the number that I'm trying to determine is in between one and d plus one. Uh, so for d equals one, it turns out that the upper bound is the one that tells us the correct value. Um, what's possible? one-dimensional complex, that's just a synonym. So a one-dimensional complex is synony synonymous with graph. Collectible one-dimensional complex is synonymous with free. And the same sequence just being that by being one leaf at a time, you get to a point. The fact that I, I collect here, so so many ways to prove this, that uh, basically it's very fun exercise at the beginning of a math course. Every has at least two leaves. Here, let me stress once again, and that assuming finding that there was uh, clear, clearly you can come up with very easy counter examples. Okay, actually, there's even a characterization of those three leaves that have exactly two leaves that are called paths. Sure, you know. Okay, so for two reasons, the number is two. Sure, for d equals one, the number is two. What about uh, this large? Uh, maybe the, the, this, this number I'm seeking to determine grows uh, subly. Can we say something about the complex achieving this meaning? I anticipate to you that the third question will remain open at the end of the talk. I, I, don't, I do not know the answer. Good. So this number does not grow at all. In fact, it even decreases, and this is the first result I want to mention. The reflex uh, of the collapse. That is in each dimension except one. In one, three is two. Other dimensions, you can always uh, achieve a, a, a complex with exactly one three fifths. I produce one. I do not have a characterization. So in particular, the complex we construct number of vertices, two to the plus one. But it could construction, it could be possible to, to find uh, an example or a completely different. So, example, so I'll be very much interested if somebody can come up with a, some sort of action or another idea as to construct. So, first of all, let me directly display you who this person is, who he is in dimension two. It's a known, known variation of the dance uh, hat, in which basically, unless instead of identifying the whole boundary, 
we identify the whole boundary three times minus one edge. There's one edge that remains unidentified. The red one is going to be the only one. About this, so our theorem is really new for dimension from the three onwards. This number, if you are into polytopes, if you are a fan of polytopes, this number does tell you something. It's a sum of two, quantity to, two quantities that are well known. So two the vertices of a cube, of the d-dimensional cube, for example, when d equals 3, it's eight vertices. And this one is, of course, the number of vertices of the d-simplex. For example, d equals 3, the tetranus, uh, four vertices. Action is a mix of these two. Well, we put a mini cube inside its polar dual. The polar dual is called cross polytope. In the three, there will be a mini cube inside an octahedron. In the next two, what are all in a thin, they're both squares. Okay. Um, the thing can be triangulated in a standard way very, with a very nice, using a very nice triangulation called anti prism subdivision. The prism for a reason it looks like a twist prism a little bit. Um, I think the idea is basically to join every face with this polar. So, uh, um, so somebody, you know, no, my, so, so two to the d is the number of vertices of the cube inside, but the uh, cross polytop, this, this cross polytop outside actually uses. 2D vertices, not D plus 1. So that, that's too many. The reason is that we still have to do, of course, identifications. So the way we do identifications is using a line shelling, which is a, a technique which is standard in polytop theory. So basically, we need to fold all of that assets on, one, on top of one another in a certain order, in such that basically you, not, you, you preserve contactability, collapsibility, and in fact, even shellability. So the complete construct in the end is shellable, which is stronger than collapse. Okay. For example, in the drawing, if you look closely, you will see levels, and you will see that the blue edges are folded on top of one another, basically like you would fold the carpenter roof. You know what I mean. This key in the end, what you're left with is like a subdivide simplex, and there you have this uh, d plus one stack. When you say that in the d equals two case, you are, you are identifying the edges around the boundary in analogy with the dunce cap, except that you are leaving one edge unidentified. Precisely. The one is, 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 is right in the drawing, if uh, this is playable. I, I'm sure actually what you can see because I don't see. see. And, so I can see the red. Yeah. yeah. So and the red is le as levels one, two. From you know, my monitor, they're visible. I, I don't know if uh, this carries through there. <laughs> well, I, I can see those. As well. So in the higher dimensions, when you do this in d equals three and d equals four, are there analogs of higher dimensional dunce caps that you're copying those identifications except leaving some things identified, or or no? Some, I guess so. It's, you could you could we didn't start from an analogous of the dunce set. We really had to start with some geometric construction. But I guess you, one could construct higher dimensional analogs of the dunce cap, not very, but in a some sort of a similar need to have basically. Not some, something, something related, yes. Well, one could think about that if there is a way to, to, to do that. But of course, what you will get, it would not be collapsible because you would have in the end no free face. Right. Quick way, actually, a quick look is only one free face, so it can be penetrated only from one, one side. It's a quick example of a contractible complex with face for part of this one. Just glue together two copies of GD on free face. For example, D equals two, take a mirror image of this guy and glue this together by identifying the two red edges, then you have destroyed you no longer have an edge uh, which is in one triangle only. And it's still contractible, of course. Thanks. Thanks. No questions? It's a good moment to stop because it's uh, my part are soon. No? If not proceed, but it's supposed to be interactive. <laughs> Did I scare everybody away or right. Okay. <laughs> Good. So that uh, essentially, maybe let me stress once again this uh, what I was uh, 
complex that is collapsible, but with a forced beginning. There's only one way basically to start. Okay, with this technique is a complex is collapsible, but only one way. In this is in the drawing from the bottom, from the red, from the red edge. So somehow the, the sequence has a forced beginning. This is because by, by gluing these things onto other stuff, you can basically drive uh, and you can use it as gadgets somehow for important theoretical results. A theoretical result for which this is needed, with a bit of introduction on Morse theory, once again, maybe you know it, but I promise you won't be long. There will be a 10-minute introduction on what Morse theory is, and then how you can use this gadget for that. If you don't question, I'll proceed to part two. So a sketch. Um, we could have most likely knows it already, but I want to sketch very briefly what Morse theory is about. The idea is uh, to study a manifold, but enclosed, uh, manifold, but uh, generic function defined on the manifold and mapping onto R. So in all textbooks, the it's a drawing of a torus, I decided to be a little bit more creative, a double torus, you have these uh, two holes, so, yeah? So it's like a double donut or a donut that did not come up really well. And the, the, as function one usually chooses, also for typographical reasons, uh, just a vertical quota, for example. It's a, a generic smooth function. So I think I've rotated the... I don't know if you can see, so that basically the shadow here is increasing, or at least that was my intention. I could this, but uh, the, the shadow here on the right, if I, if I did it right, I could have been a little bit more, uh, rotated a little bit more. But, uh, but in least I see it, we can strictly increase as a curve here, a tour. Why do I say this? Because the interest of the T is to look at the critical points the critical points of the function, where critical points really means what you think it means from calculus. So maxima, minima, shadows. Okay? So at least two critical points for Weierstrass, uh, for continuity, you know, uh, it's compact, for bias theorem. There's a mass and the mean uh, at least. But in this case, for example, you have several saddles, so at four, one saddle here, one here. They correspond basically to the, always to the uppermost and lowermost point of which um, we hold the figure. This is actually not supposed to be three-dimensional. I'm thinking of it as a two-surface in a three. Not that it may be this. Actually, it might be better to distinguish saddles, to tell saddles uh, apart. Because, uh, a saddle in a surface is something that is maximum for one coordinate direction and minimum for the other. But you know, if you have a 10 dimensional object, it might be better to distinguish something that is max for three and minimum for seven, from for five and minimum for five. So one speaks of a, the index of a critical point and that, that there's accurate definition that, that you can replay if you want. This has to be a very deep introduction to a very deep theory. But essentially the number of independent directions for f, for which point is a maximum. Okay, in this case, the, the, the maximum as is 2, and in general, the maximum is always in this d. And in a global or local minimum, as and in this whole index 1. Okay, other so situations can be. Hard. We have six critical points here, once again. One of index zero, one max of index two, and four saddles. One, two, three, and four. Questions? Good. So I gather together this information. I, uh, historically, one gathers together this information in something called Morse vector sometimes, which is just the count of the number of critical points for the index. So that would be comma four, comma one. Often is uh, the number of critical uh, mean. That one is the number of local maxima. If notice depends on the function. So here, in this case, of course, if you take a vertical quota, it's like this. But if you feel the, the um, 
if you take the, the, the function, or in, uh, basically if you rotate this image, for example, if you pull this down, of create another local minimum with respect to the vertical height. We'll have a different discrete Morse vector. The discrete Morse vector. The Morse vector depends on the function chosen. In this situation, it depends on the way you place the manifold. All right? Yeah, there's a beautiful theorem by Morse that I'm stating in a very weak, uh, in a very weak form, much than what he actually mentioned. If you want to understand a manifold up to what could be, actually what he said is much more up to diffeomorphism. But to understand a manifold up to homotopy, all you need to care about critical points. That's basically irrelevant. So manifold is homotopy equivalent to a complex cell complex that has exactly many cells as of critical points of index eyes. So for example for case, the, the, the more sector was one for one. So this is the same as saying that this guy is double torus is of the equivalent to a cell complex that consists of one point, four loops, and then two dimensional set. And if you take in fact so uh, to a torus. So in particular, uh, a simple argument in algebraic topology tells you that the Betty numbers are bound, the, the, the vector of Betty numbers is bound above by this point. So for example, for free, you have that the Betty numbers of this guy are, the first Betty number is at most one, so the zero at Betty number is at most one, this, the Betty number is at most four, and the second Betty number is at most one. If these are the Betty numbers, so if the inequalities in this case are sharp, I pick Morse function. The, uh, this most small as possible. Small that it actually is identical to the Betty vector. Basically, always to find Morse function with as few critical points as possible, I should look for the smallest. More sector in this theory. The fact that the day is a day and not an A uh, is usually a very deep theory that, with which uh, uh, Snail uh, tends to win. Even Snail uh, obtained also the field in 66, uh, handles kind of conservation. Oh. So, the discrete version of it, which is much simpler, some, often I claim that it can be explained at least uh, so uh, without. How to use it, but it can be explained even at the level of uh, and so um, also geometry is involved. We're just working now with a simple shell complex. This theory does, uh, apply, for example, to try so all smooth manifolds can be triangulated, so it does apply to uh, the serality of the smooth theory, in fact, to a much broader generality because there are simple shell complexes that, that instead do not come from. So what function? I'm going to first explain what it is. Actually, you have one or the screen. That's a discrete most function. That's it. Uh, I'm going to see this, and then I'm going to have uh, an eye on the question that I've addressed, on the issue that I've addressed before, of the smallest, of the smallest force factor, which is the goal of the theory. And my goal for today will be to prove that, actually, uh, as the title of my talk says, this you know, does not occur in, uh, in the discrete namely, It could be that the same complex as different force that are open. So what is a different Morse function? So this thing is assigning a value, a, a number, it could be a number, to all pieces. So you have a simple shell complex, you mean a number, every vertex, every edge, every triangle, and so on. OK? So that uh, certain actions are satisfied. The first one is increasing, so larger faces should get larger numbers. For example, here, you know, this triangle is containing this edge, triangle contains this edge, this edge, and the three verbs. Well, then the larger face gets a larger value. Right? If in this weekly increasing map, if you consider the simplicial complex as a post set with respect to should numbers on all of the faces Large faces get larger number. That's section number one. Is that I, you're allowed to repeat the numbers 
but at most one. So no no three faces will be assigned in the same day. I see in my picture I repeated all numbers twice, except on yeah. But the number that I assign the same value to three different things. And the finally, is a genericity condition, uh, or at least I like to call it like that. Uh, so it states that whenever you have, whenever two faces with the same gender than that, so whenever two faces assign the same number, they have to be containing one. All right. It's due to the fact that if you have a function satisfying just the first two actions, then no panic. Just by perturbing it a little bit, you get also the third one for Okay, these three actions. So, but they're very simple. One, once again, the faces get larger numbers. I cannot repeat uh, the same number more than two times. And then if two have the same uh, value, then containing one another. So the crucial point of uh, the, defi the crucial definition. So crits in, Morse, in classical Morse theory are not, not defined. The, the name already pre-existed. It's, it's what critical points used to be in calculus. Instead of here, we are now defining what the critical face is. It's something that uh, was existing before, because there's no differential structure. There's no derivative over here. There is no calculus. Call a face critical if I face the function is injective. So if it gets an exclusive, or every other, every different face gets another number. The critical faces do you see in the picture? only one, which is actually supposed to be kind of red. Only one vertex here assigned the value zero. Every face just number it was assigned with some other. Yeah? No, I have a question. So in, in for example, Robin Foreman's definition, I think his definition might be slightly different. Are they are they equivalent? Yeah. He, he produces pairs, and are your pairs, you know, the the simplicities with the same value. Yeah, they are totally, they are completely equivalent. I prefer this definition because I think to the human eye, you have to see when two quantities are equal. Actually, you don't need math. In definition, so it's always, for example, here I have four and four. In formal definition, here you could put any number smaller than four. That's right. the difference between mine and his. Right. But this whole variation is I actually put the, the, the uh, four here because to me it's easier to pair objects that actually have the same feet uh, attached to them. You know, even if uh, uh, numbers were spelled with a different, uh, so the system would still be able to do the pairing. So I prefer this way because I don't want to keep track in my mind of what versus the inclusion and what not. Okay? I think it's important to a minor simplification. It allows me to say quicker what critical faces. Is there, uh, do you have any sources you would recommend, perhaps some of yours, that present it in this way? No, uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think I have any source. I, I, I kind of, at some point, I switched to this definition. I, I think, but somehow, yeah, I don't want to claim authorship of this because I think it's well known to uh, to form an itself. It's just a variation of this definition. Yes, I think I like this one more, but because for me it's visually clearer. If you have imagine a big, big triangulation on your uh, desk to do the matching and you want to understand what faces are so this way it's easier for me graphically so some idea glasses if i if i <laughs> make uh, life more difficult to myself i'm never going to be able to find them <laughs> okay. okay that's the exact same thing so i guess it's just this is well known as a an equivalent definition so it's, it's a little okay, so it's a function that is uh, uh is keeping the so for it's a discrete most function with respect to, to this. This is a more restrictive assumption. But what is true is that you can obviously find another one that, uh, given a function in the sense of form, and you can find one like this that induces the same match. So to every practical purpose, is uh, yeah. Great, thanks. You're right. Uh, also here, I would like to have a Morse vector, and uh, actually it should be discrete. Maybe here I should have written discrete vector. It's always going to be a quantity with respect to a function. So Morse vector of a complex is just going to count now the number of critical faces of dimension i. 
Hold on. In my case here, zero, zero, because I have exactly one critical vertex, no edge, and no triangle. By convention, we stop here. I, I don't want to put an infinite sequence of zeros. Usually, we stop at dimension because obviously, uh, it's going to be all zeros after that. Um, as the B plus one. That makes the theory interesting. It's actually the same, it seems copied from Morse. That's why this is Morse theory. It's a theorem by a result by Foreman. Um, which is on the white that's a most of the simple amount of the theory that I presented at the very beginning. The point that, once again, if you want to, even if this definition is much simpler and um, seems naive to a certain extent, for function, the concept is always somewhat, so if you want, if you're interested in your complex only up to homotopy, it thought that only the critical cases matter. Everything else is irrelevant, exactly like before. The homotopy equivalent to a cell complex with as many I cell as the number of critical faces of dimension I. And when from the singular homology it follows that this then bounds the back numbers from above. For example, the theorem applied to this one tells you that the complex is homotopy equivalent to a cell complex with weight. That's my fancy way to say it's contractible. I'm doing well with time, so maybe I, let me spend five minutes to try to intuitively tell you why this is correct. And in this, actually, I think my definition uh, somehow helps a lot. So here's the advantage of this simplification. So the point is this, look at this complex here. Why would this be the case? Why do the critical is matter and why do the other one vanish somehow in the ray? <laughs> why do we not care about the faces that uh, are not critical, so the faces that share a value? Because they can all be eliminated pairwise. Pairs are exactly what you think they are, namely the pairs are the third F, just the faces and value under so it's just or just do a count down uh, analysis of your manifold starting from the maximum value of so here I try to set up a quantity that was slightly larger for the maximum. The maximum value for the function is five. Okay? So every other face is a smaller number. So the point that okay remember the actions, maybe I can quickly go back to them. So the action is uh, generic. If two faces have uh, uh, the same value, they're one containing the other. Okay, so the, if the maximum consists is attained the two faces, necessarily then inside one another. And it, it's very elementary to prove, an easy exercise to prove that one is a free face of the other, necessarily. Why would there be another triangle here containing this edge? What value would I give to it? The function has to be increased. But I have already used the number five two times, so here I would have to put a number larger than five, like six or so seven. But that's because I was assuming this was the max. And then, so case of this. All right, but I know from collapsibility, from simple homotopy theory, from the work by White in the piece that I presented at the beginning of this lecture, that if we kill both faces, the homotopy is unchanged. So we just delete. These two, it's simply shall call, and it's a collapse. And I said, go now the new maximum is these two faces, which is four and four. Okay, so one another, so kill them, and then we kill them, two and two, kill them. one kill them. Clear this place is uh, clear that uh, going to get rid of all of, the, all of the faces that are not the only ones that will remain are the critical ones. This is my sketch of a proof. If the critical faces do not matter, at least, this keep a reason why the critical ones are those to do. Yeah. All of the theory will be to find this script most function with as few critical faces as possible and to address the task of whether there exists a unique or discrete more vector or not. Question? Maybe you don't want to go into this. But what if you had numbers like five and five, which were paired, and then four and four, which were paired, and then you single uh, simplex with value three, yes. and then two simplices that were paired with value two. Um, once you, once you kill the fives and the fours, you can't kill the three. Uh, um, 
necessarily go on and kill the twos? No, to kill them in the order. What you, if you have it as a, a compass by itself as a value of three, you just remove it. But if if it's a maximum, it means that that's a facet. It has to, otherwise, you know, what would be the value of the face containing it? So at that point, at the moment you, in which you would remove it, that's a facet. So mm -hmm. you, you track it and you keep track of it. You keep track of the fact that you killed us. That's what the theorem tells you if you think about it. Because what you've done is you've a cell of that dimension. So, for example, if that was an edge, you out. You're taking that way edge, and, but the boundary is still there. So you have changed the homotopy. You have changed it in a controlled way. You have to remember it. So you, you'll get all the way down to a point, but then you have to remember all of the, oh, okay, I've done some steps. And that's what this part here of the theorem tells you. That's right. Thank you. I think that every complex is contractible. That would not be correct. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, these the steps that matter are those that you mentioned. Actually, I forgot I had one slide that mentioned more or less these things in a in a milder way. So any discrete Morse function, that's actually the answer to your question. Any discrete Morse function can be viewed as some sort of dismantling process. And we have two options, either to do elementary collapses or facet removals. Just to pass from a discrete Morse function to a sequence, this is a sequence, uh, the countdown way to remember, start at a maximum and go downwards, okay? Or please note of the definition that I, that I use. Yes, it's very clear. I, at least I find so. Anyway. So, once again, the max is attained at one phase. Clearly, the phase is a facet for the increasing reasons. And so, is a facet removal, so there's nothing to prove. And in this case, if the max is attained at two, so in here, five, five, then they must be phase of one another. It's easy to see this. The, those elementary collapses. Okay, to say what a discrete Morse vector is, is basically the number of, so it counts dimension by dimension the number of these facet removals that you need to do. Collapses. It's the same as having one zero 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 as Morse vector. Why? Well, it has only one critical phase, namely a vertex, so no critical phase of higher dimension, so that everything else can be paired in the way. Okay, complex, and you know, with this trick, you go down all the way, you do all, every, all of the phases are, are, are paired, the only way is a point, so that's the same as collapse, because with the collapses, only elementary collapses, you can reduce your complex to a point. How much time do you still have? Ten or fifteen minutes. Ten or fifteen minutes. Okay, good. Yeah, perfect. Okay, for you, um, actually enters uh, this picture. So far, I've introduced you to more theory and a little bit or this more theory. So, uh, how we, can we use the, our gas, which is like this collapsible two complex G two with only one free edge? And we are thinking in all dimension, a G3 with only one free triangle, and so on. The idea is this that uh, the complexes, as I said, have a, sort of a very restricted way to be attacked. They can be collapsed, but you have to start in a specific way. So, what happens if we glue two of them? If we I, the triangle that, in this sequence that collapses away G2, the triangle T is always paired with the edge E. E the edge. This is the way G3, T, the, the triangle T prime is always paired together with delta. So they glue these two together and identify T with T prime. This gives rise to one triangle, and then you have to choose who to pair this triangle with. Whether we be paired with delta or with the subface, the, the edge E. The idea was maybe, maybe if we study this uh, complex G2, you know, G3. It could be a good candidate for having for a complex having two complete different reductions that could give rise to two incompatible discrete vectors. This at least was our so hope. That you take G2 unit G3, and because you have on it 
two so radically different philosophies of uh, reducing the complex, or dismantling it, but impossible with one another because you have to decide so for he to pair it with, this rise to incompatible discrete most This in details, I don't really need to go into all of these details, but it turns out if you do the calculations that if you do one way, so if you, you collapse the union according to how you would collapse G2, you one one as the discrete Morse vector. So critical tetrahedron, then you plot tetrahedron away, then critical edge, and then that is uh, one that reduces to a point. If strategy gets the way down to a point. So, this is wanted to construct, namely a complex with two incompatible discrete more vectors because in two different strategies, but this one is better, strictly better than this one. So they are incomparable. This is smaller than this one. So it would be obviously a complex that has the smallest discrete more vector, namely 1, 0, 0. It turns out that it's collapsed. But this appearance, basically, by insisting on the problem and manipulating and manipulating it, and after one year of work, we that, you know, if you keep catching gadgets of this type, you do get the result. So that, that, that's, I, I have no intention, don't be scared, I have no intention to go into the details of the proof, but previous step to this new result, there's no new idea, just stress. Okay? So the result is this. It's the non-collapsible D-complex in every dimension from three that has Two mini more sectors, each one having three critical spaces. So one is a simplex, and the one instead collapses simplex according to the philosophy for which GD was cut. So this we construct in dimension three is a variation of G2 union G3. It's actually G2 root to the 10 copies of G3 plus uh, so in, so in ingenuity. And if we have the complex with 106 vertex, we wrote it down explicitly so that everybody can check it that we haven't uh, done any mysterious and so on. So, okay, so all this can be verified also computationally, I should say. And uh, if there is, a, so this complex is not a manifold. When you look at a G2 and G3, you, know, you see it immediately, it's not even pure. There's a block which is two dimensional and the block which is three dimensional. It, it is true that triangulations of manifolds have an discrete more sector, we just don't know. Um, in it, I would go, I have a prepared a bonus slide. I'm happy to stop here and take questions as you should. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, bonus, uh, like, uh, Going to a statement, the folklore statement that I said at the beginning, namely that trees have two leaves. So it's some sort of unnerving thing that one cannot generalize it to dimension. But this is sort of how to extend the notion of trees to other dimensions. So trees can be characterized as contractible complexes, dimension one, but collapsible complexes of dimension one. So in here, however, if you Exactly. So it's false that every contractible D complex has at least two free faces. This statement is false because actually I said already this answering a question at the beginning. Uh, there actually are contractible D complexes with zero free faces. And it is possible D complex has at least two free faces. By the way, in our gadget is exactly the negation of this thing. Our gadget has one face. Or every two. So, but maybe closer. So, flexible is stronger than contractible. Minimum is going to be getting close to what we want it is to. Is there a notion, maybe, it's collapsibility in the literature we could try with? It not there is one, study computer science, called non evasiveness. Uh, it's by Kant, Sachs, and Sturteva, I think, it says to very interesting open questions in computational topology. Um, this evidence is defined as follows. In dimension zero, a point non evasive. And that's it. So, meaning of contractible. So, if you have a bunch of isolated points, that's not, not 
no, sometimes the dimension zero is non-evasive if and only if it's a point, a single point. And then dimensional complex is non-evasive if the sequence of those that lead to a single point, and in addition, in addition, you delete a vertex whose link is non-evasive or dimension one less. That is recursive. Okay. None of the complexes are just trees because so you call the vertex in a graph whose link is just a point, that name is saying a leaf. The second part here just says that uh, first it's just saying that it can be reduced to a point just by simply deleting one leaf. And that's a characterization of graph, of sorry, of tree. Here is another class, it's also so not difficult to see, it's an easy exercise, that non-evasive implies collapsible. I see rather than non-evasive because it's actually a positive property and it's a bit confusing to have it in the negative. All right, so that's the right way. So this, this is what makes the following uh, the folklore result in the previous slide possible. You can put for any positive integer d, the number of free faces is in an only D complex. So this is a way to extend that every tree has at least two leaves. And um, it's actually not difficult to see that non it's by just by recursion, it's very easy to see. You reduce to the case of a tree for this inductive definition, it's easy that it has at least two. So the very hard part of this theorem is just to come up, of course, with an example of non evasive complex that has exactly to okay. With this, I think uh, I'll stop and uh, thank you all for uh, the attention. Thank you very much. A uh, clarification question, just to make sure my understanding was correct. So you've been talking about uh, smooth Morse theory. Uh, yes. Smooth Morse smooth theory. And there that um, is it true smooth manifold has a unique minimal Morse vector? Aha. Uh -huh. So it's true with respect to the the smooth theory. Okay. What I don't know is once you triangulate it, it makes minimal discrete more stack uh, with the criteria of, uh, of discrete of this more stack. This uh, it's a result, I think, I, I don't even know who proved it, but I know I proved by Keynes. Uh, every smooth manifold admits triangulation, actually a PL triangulation. It, it's not difficult to see this. Um, so, from the complicated way to see uh, is, uh, uh, the complicated way to see that actually every smooth Morse vector is a discrete Morse vector on some PL triangulation. Okay. So that this is a result that uh, I proved in uh, I think smooth and discrete Morse theory. How what can happen is that uh, you get better vector from somewhere else. So what what I can what one can prove is that every smooth Morse vector is also a discrete Morse vector on some triangulation, but it could not coming from a smooth Morse from a smooth yeah. Okay. That's very cool question. Thank Thank you. So do you have a sense of uh, what might be true for kind of large random social complexes? Some, some experiments. So the only the only way we can approach this thing. So there's some some results, some theoretical results, uh, like I think others. But uh, we've done some some computations with Frank. Lewis, uh, so in a, in a paper in experimental mathematics, I, I forgot the title. Um, you see, you can see the homology threshold quite well. Uh, we have an algorithm that somehow computes uh, this discrete Morse functions relatively fast. It actually does not really compute the function; it computes this reduction. Okay, so we can see the threshold in homology. We cannot really see the threshold in homotopy. 
Hoffman. We see the, the, the Linear Michelin Threshold for homotopy out of experiments, but the thing is that, uh, of course, making experiments, it's not really a number that approaches infinity. You have to stop at some point. I think we've done experiments with about 100 points, if I remember, uh, if I remember right. It's with the computer. The of having um, full uh, all factors, is this chimeric or is this special thing? That's an excellent question. So it depends. It depends which way you want to look at it. Already three spheres, if you take a triangle, there are triangulations of the three spheres that do not admit an optimum. So they do not admit one, zero, zero, one, and with most vectors because they have knots, for example. So one can come up with tricky, with nasty triangulations. It can be that they have, it can be that something is collapsible, but experimentally the collapse is hard to find in the sense that, you know, it's a very tricky way to go through, and maybe we have random algorithms. It methods just scans for this, and we, we even thought of this as a possible way to measure how complicated and interesting a triangulation is a priori. Just by measuring basically how many times, what kind of this, you get the whole spectrum of discrete morse vectors by inspecting, and, and uh, intuitively, the smaller the discrete morse vector, the easier the, the, the triangulation is, of course. It, it, we have some sort of, it gives you a sort of parameter to measure how intricate the triangulation, the simplicial complex. Um, so there could be obstruction, yes. There could, uh, uh, subdividing gets rid of the obstruction, but then of course the computation time explodes because uh, maybe if you have a subdivision, the number of faces increases uh, in a bad way. I don't know if maybe have. Uh, Yes. All right, thank Bruno again. So, so thanks a lot, Bruno.